So, uh, good morning, and um, for those of you who are here from out of town, uh, May is glorious in, in this part of the world, um, and we have a, a precious chunk of semi-wild nature right in the middle of the city. Most of you probably already know this, but in case not, um, I encourage you, any and all of you, if you have time, to take a walk on, uh, on Mont Royal, which is the, you know, the, the mountain in, in the middle of town. Um, I also just wanted to say that I, I, I liked all three of the talks yesterday, uh, learned a lot from them, and thought that they formed a nice progression of ideas. And so uh, thanks to you three, uh, and also to my co-organizers, Valerie and Sophia, for putting the program together so well. Seems like uh, worked <coughs> very well. <coughs> And uh, thanks especially to Claire for so directly addressing the question posed for this conference and for pointing out that different brands of animal ethics and or environmental ethics may actually diverge from each other more than the two broader fields do. So that was a really nice uh, start to the conference. I, I thank you for that. Um, my talk today will try to draw what Baird yesterday called some clear bright lines. And my method will be to step back from normative ethics into value theory, also known as axiology, where I think the lines may be a, a bit less fuzzy. I'll start with some preliminary conceptual points, then marshal some empirical input to argue for three important points of convergence between sentientist and ecocentric axiology. Namely, uh, I will assert, I will contend that um, these two value theories should agree that natural ecosystems have positive intrinsic value. <clears throat> Secondly, that in general, predation by non-humans yields net benefits. And thirdly, that uh, livestock farming yields massive net harms. I doubt anybody here will dispute that, but just to, I think it is important to um, recognize and acknowledge uh, important points of convergence uh, both for theoretical and for practical reasons. So I'll, uh, I'll argue for, um, for three of those. Then I'll kind of pause to offer a few kind of off the cuff, what I'll call convergence arguments for ecocentrism. So if these theories really do converge in these ways, um, can we nonetheless, might we nonetheless have reason to favor one or the other? And I'll argue that we do have reason to, to favor ecocentrism over sentientism. Then I will argue that, that, that there is one important point of divergence, <clears throat> and that is that per, past a, a certain stage reached long ago, the continued supplanting of wild nature by the human economy, which is happening steadily um, every year, we're chipping away at you know, wild nature and we're expanding the human economy. We're trying to, you know, for about a century, we've, we've been trying to grow the human economy at roughly 3% a year. Um, and as I tell my students in my classes, uh, this kind of exponential growth, maybe a, a more accurate term would be explosive growth, because 3% may not sound like all that much, but if you iterate 3% growth over a century, as the human economy did in the 20th century, you get an economy 16 times greater in 2000 than what it was in, in 1900. Um, and, uh, Anyway, I'll, I'll argue that uh, sentientism and ecocentrism, ecocentrism actually diverged about um, what the net harm or benefit of this, uh, <coughs> what I would call the main effect of capitalism on the world <coughs> is. And then I'll finish by talking about a, a particular version of ecocentrism that I call uh, richness theory. So <coughs> the uh, richness of animals and ecosystems. So to start with uh, conceptual preliminaries, um, just to emphasize, um, I, would, I would say that all ethics make value assumptions. So uh, the most obvious connection between a value theory and a, and a normative theory is for consequentialism, because if you're a consequentialist, then value is the only thing that matters. Your, your, your duty <coughs> is to maximize value, whatever it is. Um, other kinds of ethical theories have more complicated relationships between value, between the good and the right. Um, but even for those, uh, 
the right depends partly on the good. So if you're a, a virtue ethicist or, or a rights theorist, um, you know, you still have to respond to value in some way, although that response may be more complicated. For example, animal rights theory uh, bases the rights of non-human animals on certain intrinsically valuable properties that they have. Um, and animal rights theory, as was emphasized in some of the questions and comments yesterday, uh, also admits cases of collective value trumping individual rights. <clears throat> so just to pull out a quote from one of the classic uh, authors in animal rights theory, Tom Reagan, in his 1980 paper in Environmental Ethics, he said, an individual's right not to be harmed can justifiably be overridden only if, and he actually had three different uh, <coughs> possibilities here, but I'll just uh, include one here. Uh, only if we have very good reason to believe that allowing the individual to be harmed is a necessary link in a chain of events which collectively will prevent vastly greater harm to innocent individuals. And we have very good reason to believe that this chain of events is the only realistic way to prevent this vastly greater harm. Um, <clears throat> so I have pictures associated with a lot of these slides that are supposed to have some connection to the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the verbal points that I'm, that I'm trying to make. And in just trying to think of an example of what Regan is talking here, I uh, found a photograph of one of the Titanic lifeboats. And I was just imagining that if there were a rat on this lifeboat that was eating all the food and maybe uh, threatening to bite people and infect them with diseases, et cetera, you know, maybe that could possibly uh, constitute a case in which you throw the rat overboard to save the, the other passengers in the boat. Um, just to <clears throat> throw out a possible example of that. The other uh, basic point that I would just like to uh, remind um, people of is that uh, even individualistic value theories do assign intrinsic value to species and ecosystems. Um, it's just that they they, uh, they define the value of a species or ecosystem strictly in terms of the well-being of the organisms within it. So <clears throat> for anthropocentrists, um, basically the, the intrinsic value of a human species or um, of a, an ecosystem containing humans is just a function of the well-being of, of those humans, whether it's uh, the sum of their well-being, if you're a total utilitarian, or the average of their well-being, et cetera. Um, likewise, for a, for a sentientist, um, <clears throat> a sentientist would broaden the class of moral patients so that all and only animals able to experience pleasure, happiness, or satisfaction have intrinsic value. And again, they would define the um, total value of a, of a species or an ecosystem as some function of the well-beings of the, of the animals within it. And then biocentrism is the other uh, main individualistic theory that's uh, uh, in play within environmental ethics that ascribes intrinsic value to all <coughs> living organisms. So for example, uh, sentientism would take the happiness of this spring salamander into account, um, whereas biocentrism would take her well-being into account plus the flourishing of her moss bed, um, et cetera. And then finally, um, I think one thing that's often uh, kind of blurred or, or uh, seemingly confused is the fact that individualistic theories, or sorry, is the fact that uh, the ba basic concerns of ecocentrism include rather than substituting for those of, of sentientism. And I think this is true even of, of Aldo Leopold. Uh, there is that famous summary maxim that says that a uh, thing is right if it uh, <coughs> promotes the uh, integrity and stability and beauty of the biotic community. It, it is wrong otherwise. And that sounds like a kind of purely holistic theory. But, but another summary maxim that he has said that says that we need to respect not only the fellow members of our bi biotic community, i.e. the individual animals and plants, uh, but also the community as such. So it's a more uh, <coughs> balanced kind of view. And I think uh, deep ecology is the same. I think um, 
you know, any reasonable version of ecocentrism is going to have basic concerns that include, rather than substituting for, those of sentientism. So uh, ecocentrism would assert that all organisms, species, and ecosystems have intrinsic value that is not reducible to the well-being of their components. Um, so that <coughs> contrasts them with the individualistic theories that we saw one slide ago. For example, deep ecology says that the well-being and flourishing of human and non-human life on Earth have values in and of themselves, but that richness and diversity of life forms contribute to the realization of these values, but are also values in themselves. And then uh, the other kind of uh, ecocentrism that I'll discuss in this talk is what I'll call richness theory, and I will say more about that later. Um, but uh, richness theory would attribute intrinsic value not only to the satisfaction of sentient animals' preferences, but also to the integrity of ecosystems, uh, as well as many other properties at multiple levels of organization, from the cellular to the biospheric and uh, actually beyond. Um, so richness theory uh, might require direct moral concern not only for the animals living within this rainforest, but also for the degree to which it holds on to water and nutrients and cycles them in harmony with the air above and the soil below. Nutrient cycling, water cycling, et cetera, plausible examples of uh, what people call ecological integrity. Um, now, another thing that this means is that for an ecocentrist, sometimes what Midgley called social concerns that are based on sentience will outweigh ecological concerns. For example, when faced with a choice between two options that involve large differences in suffering, but not much difference, let's say, in species diversity or other higher level properties. In the opposite kind of case, of course, a large ecosystemic difference will outweigh a small animalistic one. So, you know, for an ecocentrist, in some cases, let's say animal sentience will trump ecosystemic properties, depending on what what choices are facing. In other cases, things will go the other way, but uh, since they're both, since they both have um, intrinsic value, you have to, you know, you have to kind of uh, do the math, <coughs> let's say. And a lot of what will follow uh, kind of involves doing the math in different ways, so. And then I wanna finish the kind of preliminary comments that I have by highlighting um, a bit of social scientific research that um, I think maybe goes against what a lot of people have assumed within uh, at least environmental ethics. Um, so here is a, a paper by a pretty uh, prominent environmental social scientist, um, Lizarowitz, who was at, at least was at the Yale School of Forestry who found that when Americans were surveyed, so this, uh, this graph actually refers to Americans, um, overwhelming majorities agreed with such statements as uh, humans have moral duties and obligations to non-living nature. <clears throat> so that actually goes beyond sentientism or biocentrism or maybe even ecocentrism because <clears throat> talking about non-living nature. Um, definitely at least goes out to a, a biocentric um, <clears throat> scope. So uh, <clears throat> letter F here is that humans have moral duties and obligations to plants and trees. So these are just the, uh, the different questions and then the, the Y axis is the percent of respondents that um, either somewhat agree or strongly agree with those. Um, I'm not sure how that extra text got there. Um, so, yeah, and, and whereas uh, most Americans disagree with statements like humans are not part of nature, humans have the right to subdue and control nature, humankind is created to rule over nature. <coughs> so this is a kind of uh, perhaps surprising result, but, it, but I think it's been supported by subsequent research as well. And I think it poses a challenge to sentientists. Um, and that is, since it seems to be true that most people already have value theories that are broader than what you're advocating. Um, do you really want to spend your career trying to get people to narrow their moral horizons? 
um, and sometimes attempts to slam the door shut after animals remind me of arguments defending anthropocentrism against Singer's pioneering work in animal ethics. So just to throw out that kind of challenge. Okay, so on to the uh, first claimed convergence between sentientism and ecocentrism, and that is the idea that natural ecosystems have positive intrinsic value. And the, 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 uh, the evidence or the argument that I'm gonna use um, actually draws upon a calculation that uh, another one of our speakers, who will go uh, a little bit later today, Oscar Otta, um, did in one of his papers from 2010, um, where he talked about the Atlantic cod in the Gulf of Maine, um, and basically calculated, uh, he said 200 billion seconds of coddling suffering per year. Um, I think it actually should be 100 because um, if it's 2 million eggs per female, that would be um, 1 million eggs per fish if, if, if there's an equal sex ratio, but it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't crucially depend on that. So basically 100 billion seconds of coddling suffering per year, um, and he gets to that figure by saying, okay, maybe there are roughly a million adult cod in the, in the Gulf of Maine, um, and perhaps uh, of those, and, and uh, for each adult, one million eggs are laid per year, and maybe those eggs have about a 10% objective probability of, of hatching, um, and then since the, the boundaries of sentience might be a little fuzzy, uh, he gives a 10% subjective probability that these little fish, these little fishlings are, are sentient. And then he assumes that um, if one of these things get eaten, as most of them do, that they experience about 10 seconds of terror, pain, um, 10 seconds of, of suffering per codling eating, eaten by a predator. And based on this kind of calculation, uh, or to claims, or at least strongly suggests, that what he calls the idyllic view of nature is wrong and that suffering prevails. But the problem is that this estimate only quantifies one side of the balance sheet. And everyone already knows that there's plenty of suffering in nature. For it to prevail, uh, that suffering would have to outweigh the positive side of the balance sheet or what uh, Peter Singer calls enjoyment. And if we do that in this case, it seems clear to me that the, the positive side plausibly massively outweighs the, the negative side, at least as quantified by, by Orta. So, <clears throat> for example, uh, we might imagine that those individual coddling actually experienced plenty of joy and you know, positive experiences in the, in the days or weeks before they got, before they got eaten. Um, you know, it seems easy at least for me to imagine that they experienced at least 10 seconds worth of, uh, of enjoyment, and enough to outweigh the, the terror that they experienced at the end of their lives. Um, but since the, the codlings are a part of the kind of reproductive system of, of the cod, we can also balance the adult cod's positive experience against the, the negative experiences of the, um, of the coddling. And again, this is, I'm staying within the realm of, of value theory. I'm not saying whether it's uh, normatively okay to sacrifice a coddling for the sake of uh, the adult's enjoyment. I'm just trying to <coughs> see what the balance is. Um, and, and what it works out to is that an adult cod, in order to individually outweigh the suffering of all of its offspring, would only have to experience enjoyment for about a day per year, or about a day's worth of enjoyment per year. Um, and then finally, we need to take into account the, uh, the eaters uh, of the coddling um, and the well-being that they experienced that was enabled by the nutrition they got. And again, um, it's easy for me to imagine that being more than 10 seconds worth of, 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 of coddling suffering. So I would say that any one of the above goods by itself easily outweighs the suffering estimated by Orta even more for the three combined. Okay, so now let's, let's broaden the, uh, the, uh, the calculation and, and also take into account ecological goods, <coughs> which are of direct concern for ecocentrists alone. Um, presumably, uh, well, 
<clears throat> the, the cod species does contribute to species diversity. Uh, the cod lineage is sustained by the R-selected reproductive strategy that, uh, that they have of producing lots of eggs and, and hoping that at least a couple of them survive uh, per generation. Um, predator diversity is, is, is probably sustained by predation on codlings. And then um, since the cod themselves are predators and, and they're close to the top of the food chain as I understand it, um, it may be that, that the cod have what's called a keystone predator effect. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a minute. But uh, in many cases, prey diversity is sustained by, um, by predation. And, and I'll, I'll go into, go into that uh, in a little bit more detail. And then, and then also uh, things like ecosystem function, so COD's contribution to energy flow, nutrient cycling, biomass stability, et cetera. <coughs> okay, so <clears throat> second claim is that uh, sentientism and ecocentrism should also converge on the idea that predation by non-humans often or maybe even uh, in general yields net benefits. And, and again, I'm going to um, use an example that Orta discussed, and this is in a different one of his papers from, uh, from the same year, um, and that is of uh, the wolf in Yellowstone National Park. Um, and again, there is a negative side to reintroducing wolves because they do kill animals. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, there have been declines in population size uh, in both one prey species, the elk, and in one competitor species of the wolf, and that is the coyote. Um, and they've been pretty substantial, I think, in both cases. And Orta also um, makes the case, and I'm not going to challenge it, that uh, he talks about the elk, but maybe even in, in, in both species, the remaining members of those species have experienced declines in their individual well-being. So um, they're arguably more fearful because they're now subject to predation by wolves or, or uh, other kinds of aggressive behavior if you're a coyote, uh, and less nourished because the elk now uh, don't venture into areas where they're <coughs> more likely to be found and, uh, and attacked by wolves, et cetera. And then some of those areas have their preferred uh, food species. So, so it seems plausible that, um, that they might have experienced declines in, uh, in individual well-being. Um, I guess yesterday the, the possibility was entertained that in some, in some cases, <coughs> predators might actually benefit their prey species. The, the deer was discussed. So maybe by preying on deer, they're saving the deer from starvation, which would be a worse fate. But I'm not going to make that claim here. I'm going <coughs> to um, just grant that the elk are, are worse off. <coughs> but again, we have to weigh the positive effects of wolf introduction. And at least as far as I can tell from the, from the scientific literature, um, those positive effects are pretty overwhelming. So first of all, we have to count the wolves themselves, uh, whose numbers are you know, currently well above their starting point in, in 1995. Um, second item is that Maybe surprisingly, another one of the wolf prey species, the bison, has risen substantially in, in numbers. Um, and, uh, and this effect is, is actually the classic type of keystone, keystone effect where a predator benefits one of its own prey species by releasing that prey species from competition by another prey species. So before the wolves came back, the elk were out competing the bison. The bison were not doing very well. Now that the wolves have knocked the elk back, the bison have, have, have really uh, resurged. But keystone predators can benefit many other species as well, not, not just in this classic way of knocking back a superior predator. Um, and in the case of the wolf, um, it looks like scores of other sentient animal populations have risen substantially since the wolf's return. And I've, uh, I've put in bold the, the groups here that represent more than one species. So American badgers, amphibians, that's a pretty broad um, class of sentient animals. Bald eagles, bears, probably two species. Uh, beavers, common yellow throats, which is a kind of songbird. Quite a few songbirds have come back 
again because uh, the willows and cottonwoods and other things that the elk <coughs> used to that the elk used to overgraze are now uh, kind of recovering the, the habitat. Um, ducks, fish, gray foxes, hawks, Lincoln sparrows, mice, muskrats, rabbits, ravens, red foxes, reptiles, river otters, song sparrows, warbling vireos, weasels, willow flycatchers, and yellow warblers. So that that's that's just the uh, the sheer numbers side of uh, the positive balance. But it seems to me that there are probably also associated increases in average well-being since they now have better food, habitat conditions, etc. Um, and again, I, to me, these, these gains seem to clearly outweigh the losses experienced by elk and coyotes, which are the only species that I know of that have been negatively impacted by the wolf's <coughs> reintroduction even before considering enhanced species diversity, ecosystem function, et cetera, for their own sake, um, as an ecocentric um, value theory would do. Finally, with regard to diverge, uh, convergence, um, and, and again, I, I maybe don't expect anybody to, uh, to disagree about this one, but um, uh, the idea is that livestock farming yields massive net harms uh, on the negative side of the balance. And I'm thinking just in temporal order here, in order to engage in livestock farming, first you have to destroy a lot of wild habitat in order to grow food, uh, either directly for the animals as, as in a pasture or um, growing crops, which you then take to a, a you know, farm or something and feed to the animals. Uh, and strikingly, 80% of all agricultural land goes to feed, feed livestock, not humans directly. And in 2015, um, a group of authors, including William Ripple, who is interestingly one of the uh, biologists who uh, has demonstrated this keystone predator effect of wolf reintroduction. He was also part of a team that uh, claimed that animal agriculture is now the number one driver of biodiversity loss worldwide. Add to that massive air and water pollution from greenhouse gases, soil erosion, fertilizers, pesticides, etc. And then on to the uh, you know, concerns about individual sentient animals, billions of domesticated animals immiserated on factory farms where most of the meat now comes from. And then even for humans, increased heart disease uh, and other human health problems. And there doesn't seem to be much on the, on the positive side, um, at least as far as I can tell except for some limited nutritional benefits in some human populations, with that, which I think are real, um, but, uh, but wouldn't outweigh the, the negatives in this case. <clears throat> okay, so just to pause um, after going through those three claimed convergences, um, I guess I would... Uh, assert that, that we do have qualitative convergence, but, there, but there's also quantitative divergence. So they agree about the, you know, the, the direction of the, of the balance, um, but since ecocentrism counts not only the net pleasure, happiness, and satisfaction experienced by animals, but also the flourishing and health of non-animal organisms, and the variety and harmony among organisms within and across more than animal ecosystems, um, it seems that uh, sentient, or sorry, ecocentrism would ascribe much greater positive intrinsic value to natural ecosystems, positive net benefit to predation by non-humans, and negative uh, impact or, or net harm uh, to livestock farming. <coughs> Next, I'm just going to throw out a, a few um, arguments for ecocentrism. Um, that I'm calling convergence arguments. Um, <clears throat> and the first one is based on public opinion. Um, so if the practical implications of, of sentientism and ecocentrism do largely converge, uh, maybe it's best to stick with ecocentrism, since sentientism contradicts public opinion, as we saw in that graph a few slides ago, whereas ecocentrism coheres with it. And uh, I don't want to put too much emphasis on this particular argument, but, uh, but it is analogous to an argument that has been made in, uh, in environmental ethics for anthropocentrism by Brian Norton, who I think wrongly assumed that the public generally ascribes to, or subscribes to anthropocentrism. I think, the, I think he just made a, a, a false 
<coughs> um, empirical assumption there. Secondly, uh, inference to the best explanation. Um, if you happen to be more confident in the three value judgments discussed above than in either of the two value theories, so you're kind of undecided between sentientism and ecocentrism, but you're pretty sure about those, uh, those judgments that I, that, I, um, <clears throat> that I discussed, then it's best to go with ecocentrism because it supports those judgments more strongly. As I said, the, the balances are more extreme either in the positive or the negative direction for ecocentrism. And then finally, something like type one versus type two error in statistical inference. Um, and the idea here is just that it's, uh, it would be worse to mis mix mistakenly exclude from direct moral consideration a being or entity who deserves it than to mistakenly include one who does not. Um, I won't say too much more about that. I'm just kind of throwing out some possible <coughs> arguments. On to the divergence, though, because I think egocentrism and sentientism do strongly diverge on this last value judgment. And that is that past a certain point reached long, long ago, the continued supplanting of wild nature by the human economy amounts to a grave net loss. And here is uh, one picture of the negative side of that uh, equation, um, something called the, the Living Planet Index, where the what used to be called the World Wildlife Fund, collects all of the studies that they can find worldwide um, of vertebrate populations. So this is most of the sentient beings that uh, uh, sentientism uh, concerns itself with. Um, and and, and, and they, they, they limited themselves to the period from 1970 to 2012 because that was the period where they had a large number of such studies. Um, and what they did was just take the average um, over all those populations that they gathered from the literature um, to get this overall measure of, of what's been happening to these vertebrate populations <coughs> worldwide. So I guess they had uh, 14,000 populations, almost 4,000 species, um, and the, 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 the average change is um, a, a drop of 58%. And um, yeah, so that's the, that's the negative side of the equation. I want to pause here as well and, and kind of uh, just connect this statistic to some of the things that were said before. Um, to their credit, the animal rights theorists Donaldson and, and Kimlicka cite this statistic repeatedly uh, and with appropriate dismay. On the other hand, if suffering really did prevail in nature, this full-on collapse would actually count as a good thing. Fewer sentient animals, less suffering. As we have seen, however, nature is not hell. It's not heaven, but it's not hell. And in fact, it has tre tremendous positive intrinsic value by either sentientist or ecocentrist, ecocentric criteria. However, even if we acknowledge the positive balance of joy versus pain in nature, we still have to weigh its collapse against the explosive growth of the human enterprise. So what I'll try to do next is um, do that weighing both from a sentientist and an ecocentric uh, point of view. <clears throat> so here's the sentientist calculus. Um, and what I did is I, I, I took the uh, WWF's Living Planet Index statistics, and I made some assumptions, which may very well be wrong. Um, but based on the assumptions that I, that I made, I calculated that in 2012, there were about 100 billion fewer individual wild vertebrate animals living on Earth than there had been in, in 1970. And I, if anybody wants to ask about um, the confidence I have in that or, or how I uh, came up with that figure, I, I'd be happy to talk more about it. Um, what we do know is that there, are more than, there were more than 3 billion more humans in 2012 than in 1970. Um, and so that raises the question of how to weigh the, in, you know, the increase against the decline. Um, and it turns out that there is uh, something called the encephalization quotient, which is a measure of how 
big an animal's brain is relative to uh, expected size for a more general class. And if we look at human brain size and compare that to the expected brain size for an average vertebrate, like an amphibian, um, humans have brains about 200 times greater than you would expect for, let's say, a, a giant salamander, um, of which there are a couple that are about human size, the Chinese and the, and the Japanese. Um, and yeah, obviously there, um, there might be a, okay, so I'll just, um, I won't say much more about that here. But um, just plugging these figures in and, and, and doing the math uh, entails that um, having three billion more humans, that three billion more humans arguably experience more than enough total well-being to outweigh the well-being for gone by having 100 billion fewer wild sentience. And this would be true if you uh, thought that average well-being was the important thing as well, because what we're doing is we're replacing less sentient wild animals with more sentient humans, and so that would raise the uh, that would raise the average as well as the as well as the total. Um, okay, let's contrast that um, sentientist calculus with uh, an ecocentric calculus. Um, and one way of thinking about um, the difference is in terms of what I call diminishing returns and, and higher level interaction. Um, so whereas uh, total utilitarianism, for example, um, counts all population increases as equal, as long as well-being, as individual well-being is not changing. Whereas for an ecocentrist, Growing the already huge human population adds little to its intrinsic value. Whereas shrinking a myriad of already tiny wild populations subtracts a lot from their intrinsic value. Um, and then the other part of it is um, higher level interaction, uh, which is associated with the intrinsic value of harmony. Um, and I, in this case, um, I would just uh, suggest that humanity's parasitic relationship to the rest of nature degrades the overall level of harmony slash integrity slash unity between species. Um, and so for, for an ecocentrist, I would assert that these ecological effects of exponential economic growth outweigh the social or, or um, psychological consequences that were discussed in the last, um, in the last slide. <coughs> So now a few more, um, like maybe a slightly different way to think about sentientism versus ecocentrism and, 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 a, and a bit more about um, richness theory, the version of ecocentrism that I'd like to highlight at the end here. <coughs> so I guess the slide got messed up here. I apologize for that. Um, one problem that I have with sentientism is that I think it's, it's stuck with the undeniable hierarchy of individual level intrinsic value. Um, the diagram on the left here is one that I've seen a number of times uh, in different talks, or like uh, some of my co-lecturers have used it, um, which, which I think um, is wrong, but if we revised it to something more like uh, on the right-hand side, and what, what I, all I did here is I put the, the whale on top, because I think maybe an individual whale has more intrinsic value than an individual human being. I'm not sure, but I'm willing to entertain that, that possibility. Um, but as Singer put it, if you had to save a mouse or a human from a burning building and you couldn't save both, you should, you should go with, uh, with the human. And so, um, so I think sentientism is kind of stuck with this uh, hierarchy of, of individual level um, intrinsic value. Whereas ecocentrism tempers that hierarchy with complementarity and harmony between species. Um, and one way that uh, Thomas Aquinas put it, uh, this is quoted from uh, a paper by Erka in 1983, just because an angel is better than a stone, it does not follow that two angels are better than one angel and one stone. And what this suggests is that the value of the whole is not the sum, 
or the average or any other function of the values of the parts alone, um, but that the contribution <coughs> of a part to the value of the whole depends on other things, such as how different it is from the other parts. And that's not a, that's not a property of the individual itself. It's a property of the relationship between the individuals, or basically the, the value of uh, variety. Um, and then uh, richness theory would, would also ascribe intrinsic value to harmony between um, individuals and between species. So as Peter Miller put it in 1983, plants and animals have extrinsic utilitarian values as resources for one another, um, but the circle of such utilitarian relations may constitute an ecosystem containing the intrinsic values of a symbiotic harmony of diverse functions. Um, now Miller is a retired Canadian environmental philosopher who was the first treasurer of the International Society for, for Environmental Ethics. Uh, and Baird responded to some of his work in the early 1980s. Um, but then he, he, as far as I can tell, and, and the rest of the field seem to, left, seem to have left that work behind. Um, and I don't think that should have happened um, because I think Miller was onto something here. And, and maybe just to um, talk about the, the image that's here related to cooperation between individuals and between species. Uh, the picture is just of a mixed species flock of neo neotropical birds, uh, namely blue-headed parrots, orange-cheeked parrots, red and green macaws, mealy parrots, and tui parakeets. So just related to interspecific inter harmony. Um, there's another Canadian philosopher, Kent Peacock, who basically reviewed what we've learned since Darwin about mutualistic or cooperative relationships within nature. Obviously, Darwin emphasized competitive and other negative interactions. But we've, <clears throat> we've learned a tremendous amount about positive interactions since then. And as Peacock put it, um, earthly life has proved remarkably resilient for over 3.5 billion years. This could only be possible if life, despite the constant recurrence of endemic parasitism at all scales from the viruses to, the, to human society, has had, so far at least, a net tendency to cooperate in order to maintain the conditions necessary for, for its continuance. Um, and the, the picture here is of something that I read about recently, and that is um, it's a relationship between uh, spotted salamander embryos growing in their eggs and a, an algae species that actually works its way into the cells of the growing salamanders and helps, uh, helps the salamander get uh, more um, nutrition, I guess, through photosynthesis. And presumably the salamander is providing the, the algae with, uh, with other um, benefits, maybe protection from being eaten, et cetera. Um, and I just use that example because spotted salamanders uh, occur <coughs> in this area. So just to talk a bit more uh, systematically about richness theory, um, it's a theory according to which all value, all intrinsic value, is a function of variety and harmony. Uh, synonyms, uh, a synonym for variety being diversity, near synonyms for harmony being integrity, unity, functioning, um, and synonyms for the general concept, unity and diversity, organic unity. Um, and from the perspective of this theory, Sentience does turn out to be very important because it is an especially rich kind of richness uh, that involves harmonies between the sentient subject and the varied objects of her satisfaction, knowledge, love, etc. Um, and then, of course, there are other kinds of richness at higher levels of organization, such as cultural diversity within the human species and within others, uh, species diversity, ecosystem function, etc. And um, I think. Christiane is not here today, but yesterday she said something like, you know, political philosophy can move forward without deciding whether cultural diversity has only in instrumental value or also has intrinsic value. And I guess I would disagree because it seems to me that if, if we ascribe intrinsic value to cultural diversity, it should motivate us to work harder in keeping languages, which are also suffering catastrophic uh, extinction rates, alive then you know, we'd, we'd be more concerned with uh, keeping those languages alive than we would if, <coughs> if we thought cultural diversity had only um, <coughs> instrumental value. 
And I'll close by just saying that, um, you know, once I signed on to richness theory after reading some papers by Peter Miller, uh, Chris Kelly from University of, Chicago, uh, University of uh, Colorado, and elsewhere, I started noticing explicit or implicit references to richness all over the place, um, which suggests to me that it's a much more widespread kind of view than might first meet the eye. And here are just a couple of examples uh, from that classic uh, work by Aldo Leopold. He talks about, um, in the foreword, a law of diminishing returns in progress that has to be balanced against an increasing cost in, natural, in, in things natural, wild, and free. Um, and diminishing returns, uh, if you recall, was the way that I was trying to cash out the value of variety in and of itself. Um, Leopold also waxed poetic about harmony in nature, and, and one way that he put it is that conservation would enable a state of harmony between men and land. Uh, and then to cite a more recent example, um, there's a rather striking statement at the very beginning of the Ecuadorian constitution that was passed by an overwhelming majority of the people in, in 2008 that says, we the sovereign people hereby decide to build a new form of public coexistence in diversity and harmony with nature. Um, and and uh, Ecuador was actually the, uh, the first country in history to grant constitutional rights to ecosystems. So in a later uh, clause of the, of the constitution, they gave constitutional rights to ecosystems. Thank you. <clears throat> That's a very good question. I, I have no idea is the answer. Um, I guess I was just trying to uh, think about you know, whether the, the coddling remembers its experiences of pleasure or pain. I was just trying to think about whether it might have enough of the positive kind of experience to outweigh the, 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 the negative ones. But um, do you know anything more about coddling? You want to? Yeah, I don't know. I'd love to be later. So I yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I um, how do you think that question would affect the question of whether the codlings 
life in and of itself was worth living? Um, I guess it's a question I would. Well, I would think it would have a profound uh, <laughs> implication for that. But, but, uh, so, uh, in, in a positive direction? No, rather in the negative sense, though, okay. to say that uh, if there's no self awareness, there, to speak in <coughs> organic terms, uh, let's say, is there a subject of life uh, that we can that we can attribute to to a Claude Fingling? We have to remember that uh, Reagan speculated that subjectivity of a life ended with uh, I think adult mammals, as, as I write they recall something like that. So um, so I think it would have uh, really great significance for you know, whether or not we want to count uh, Todd fingerlings in some sort of design calculus. I think you're right <laughs> that, that uh, within sentientism, you know, like a, a more organic uh, approach would um, maybe not consider coddling suffering at all because they're not subjects of a life, whereas a more singarian approach would, uh, would Count their pleasure and pain, and of course, an ecocentric approach, which is broader still, would, would. I, I think you're right, but I, the point of my question is to challenge the Singerian uh, view that there is really any pleasure or pain to be taken account of, okay. unless there is some sense of a robust sense of self and a hmm. some sort of of uh, uh, degree of experience which is temporally protracted. Yeah, I I guess uh, so. That's interesting because you're you're an ecocentrist, but you're saying for you, sentient experience only counts if you're a subject of a life and not if you merely experience pleasure or pain. I, I'm, I'm not speaking from the perspective of. Um, you have a very long queue, so I maybe we can okay. get back to your question. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you the, sorry, I don't know you need to. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to ask about uh, sort of the human, the increase in the human population outweighing the loss in the non-human population. So uh, that was interesting. So that I guess the idea there is that the, the claim seems to be the more sentient you are, the better your life is. And that doesn't seem obvious to me. I mean, you know, because humans have to do all sorts of crappy things that non-humans don't have to do, like great papers and pay taxes. And then we and then you know the cods get to die these sort of quick, relatively painless deaths. And we like we like spend years dying, you know, suffering all sorts of horrible ailments. And yeah, and so the best argument for that sort of view that the more sentient you are, the better your life is, I feel like was came from Mill, and it wasn't that good. You know, sort of competent judges. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's just not clear that we're in a position to judge how good the goods of a of a pod life, the pod's life are. Um, so yeah, I just wondered if you could say a bit more. Sort of support that. Yeah. So uh, I agree. It's uh, it's, a, it's a debatable um, assumption that you know the. The greater the sentience, the greater the well-being. Um, and to me, it's it's intuitive. Um, but if that's false, if there if there's actually little or no difference between, let's say, the average well-being or the capacity for a positive balance, um, depending on how sentient you are, um, I think that <coughs> might lend itself to. The opposite kind of extreme. So, so what I've argued here is that if you assume that sentience uh, correlates with well-being, then you're going to be led to the conclusion that yes, we should keep on replacing wild vertebrates with more and more humans. But if you make, if you go to the other extreme and assume that there's basically little, little or no difference, then you might be led to the conclusion that actually we need to drive. You know, our species extinct because we're so much larger, and, and even if we, you know, reduce our consumption to Pleistocene levels, like to our natural levels of consumption, <coughs> uh, we still support a lot more um, frogs and mice 
on the same resources as um, as a human, and, th and therefore at least on a total utilitarian view. So I think, in general, I think um, individualistic theories are kind of subject to one or the other extreme. Either we should drive ourselves extinct, or we should keep driving everything else extinct. But yeah, that, that's a good point. But it's, um, I don't know if I have uh, that much more to say about which, which one is correct, yeah. except that it just seems intuitive to me that Bill was on to something. Yeah. <clears throat> one quick thought. So I, I, I want to keep, so I have a really long list now, so okay. I'm just going to yeah. not allow any follow-ups until, yeah. we're going through, until we've gone through the list. And what is next? Uh, yes. Okay, so I have two questions, but I'll go to just one question. Um, so uh, I, I remember back when I was studying with you this well uh, diagram that you put the well on top, so I see that it's still there. Um, and I'm wondering how you answer then the... Because the thing is, I think people are pretty happy that with the sentences you were able to say, well, you know, if, 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 the, if you have to save uh, an individual and there's two in danger, and one is a, a rat and one is a human, you're going to save the human. So uh, in your view, then you say first the whale, because it's bigger, so it's more diverse, and then say an elephant, and then say, is this how you answer the question? Or are you satisfied with that? Is that like that? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't. Um, so going back to that diagram, it's not, and I, and I apologize that the right hand one got messed up. I how that happened. <coughs> I'm not um, <coughs> strongly arguing that but I think you know the, the greater the distance um, in this diagram, the more clear it is that okay, yeah, you should favor an individual human over an individual mouse or an individual snake or whatever. Definitely than an individual mushroom. That is beyond scientism. So um, it, it's uh, it's less clear to me exactly what the hierarchy is than that there is some hierarchy of uh, individual level well-being, um, capacity for well-being, and then what you're So to decide who to save or to save. Yeah. <laughs> so Richard is next on us. Oh, okay. Uh, you can pass me up to the second queue. I think it's our last right there. Okay. Uh, awesome. Okay, well, thanks for your challenges uh, forward. I mean, we've been discussing this before, so um, yeah, I think I'll repeat basically what I said the, the last time. So um, yeah, uh, regarding the first of all these um, this calculus concerning the cloud. So uh, you know, I don't regret I chose those numbers because I I thought they were like pretty convincing, uh, and uh, and I never believed them. I, I I always thought they were way too conservative. So you know the idea that only 10% of the of the eggs end up you know that's way too conservative, and the claim that there is a 10% probability <coughs> of their ascending, I mean these uh, fishes, that seems way too conservative to me as well. So I I think that the odds uh, are I wouldn't say overwhelmingly, but I would say that uh, yeah, pretty much closer to one than to say 0 0.5 that they are ascending. I mean, of course, we don't know why entities are sentient because we don't know uh, in which, in what uh, way, must uh, matter, must uh, some physical entities work so consciousness arises. But uh, we cannot have some clues, and it seems that when you have some sort of um, system, integrated system, coordinated system that is processing information, then uh, that might be enough for sentience to, to appear. So in the biological world. What we have with, with orgasm, this is a cent, um, <coughs> uh, nervous systems that are somehow centralized, right? They don't need to have a brain, maybe. Because, for instance, if you consider um, uh, gastropods um, and bivalves, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. um, they don't have a, a centralized nervous system with a brain, but they, they have this pairs of ganglia, you know, and then also they have opioid receptors. The way they behave, you know, some of them have eyes, some of them have their their um, uh, their heart uh, uh, beating with rhythm increases when they are threatened. 
So, you know, it's not clear, but the evidence seems to suggest that they make sense. So, I think that the, um, that the total amount of suffering being there is uh, probably much way higher than the one that I estimated. Uh, also, because you know, if you are um, I don't know, a cordling that is starving to death, you're not going to die in 10 seconds. It's going to be a, a, a much longer death. So, many animals, maybe most animals, I don't know, but many animals just come into existence and, you know, never eat. They just die. And that's the, li the limited factor in, in that case, maybe, or maybe not, but they just happen to be in that situation. No one attacks them, no one the rest of their life, but just no food, they die. So, that's not a 10 second death. And uh, in addition, when you consider um, the adult cut, you know, you are somehow assuming that their lives are, are great. So, I, I'm kind of, I <coughs> think that there might be net positive, but you know, not really, mm, not really very different from a life that could be somehow uh, neutral, close to the zero level. So that's why they, they wouldn't uh, outweigh uh, suffering of the other animals. All this setting aside, you know, egalitarian concerns that I may have. And concerning the, um, the, other, the other paper, the one on the ethics of the ecology of fear, well, in that paper, I, uh, I never claim that uh, that measure uh, increases uh, the total amount of this value, because I don't know. And the main reason why I don't know is because um, all the effects that this has in mesopredators uh, you know, as uh, I mean, although some research has been carried out, it, it's not really clear. Um, <coughs> but there's a point there, which is that uh, so so it may well be that you know uh, predation is reduced actually and so on. But um, you know, there is an underlying assumption, which is that you tend to assume that a uh, higher number of animals means higher well-being, and that's what I challenge. That's what I, what I mean. I think it's. Probably. And uh, so, so that will be the way I will define myself. But uh, and again, uh, in, in that case, I'm not claiming this. So the the purpose of that page of that paper was actually to challenge the view that uh, you know uh, those kind of measures, because there are more animals, uh, there's more marine animals, and so on, uh, should lead us to assume that you know there's more animals. And just a minor point, when you are considering in this, uh, we call this sentient this comparison, something like that, the six million or six billion humans against the reduction on, on, on yeah, the total number of vertebrates, well, the thing is that um, you didn't include uh, farmland. So uh, you have like, currently it's about 70, mil 70 billion farm animals in, in land farms, plus uh, between maybe 70 and 140, something like that, a billion uh, farm fish, and there are no estimations of, of farm uh, invertebrates. And <coughs> so you know, when you consider them, I mean, probably it's not really worth it. Um, but the problem then is that <laughs> the, you may use this consideration that oh, maybe you know, the more humans, the worse because they are eating animals. So if something happened and a billion humans meaning humans disappear, then the total you know, amount of suffering would be greatly reduced. So, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive maybe. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I guess I just have a, a few um, responses. And, and one of them is that I, I actually really appreciated uh, your, your papers, and especially the, the first paper about the COD, for bothering to try to quantify the, the suffering, you know? I think that's a very valuable exercise to try to you know, apply your ethical theory in a very concrete uh, sense. Um, but I guess the, the, the meta point that I was trying to make is that you can't argue that suffering prevails in nature unless you look at both sides of the equation. And, and, you're, and you're right, the, the, the positives that I offered here, which I think easily outweigh the negatives that you, that you uh, described, um, could be a question. I, I guess I disagree that I'm assuming that the adult cod's life is wonderful. I'm just saying the net well-being has to be worth about a day per year. So, so maybe it's just barely worth living by about a day's worth. That, that doesn't seem like a, a huge, hugely uh, optimistic of an assumption to me. Um, but, but yeah, the meta point is just that you, you have to look at, at 
both sides before you even, I think, make uh, or, or try to assert something about what prevails uh, in, in nature from either, um, <clears throat> from either perspective. And then, uh, yeah, you're right. I, I, I did leave out the, um, the uh, <coughs> billions of domesticated animals that are, that are suffering, uh, maybe partly because I already asserted that both ecocentrism and, and sentientism would agree that animal agriculture in general is a, is a complete disaster. Um, and so, so maybe a way to re, reframe this would be, okay, what if we did what the two theories imply that we should do, and that, that is got rid of animal agriculture, but then still decided to, to grow the human population and replace uh, wild um, vertebrates with, with more and more and more humans. I think, I think you would still get the same kind of problematic um, conclusion in, in that case, but, but uh, yeah, you're right, considering farm animals would change the equation. So next to one, sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah. Um, I had a qu well, I had two questions, but I'm going to put myself to one. So um, it's about richness theory. I'm, I'm interested, I'm curious to know um, if you could say a little bit more about harmony. So I always found in Leopold the integrity, uh, I never really got it uh, outside of, uh, you know, um, an organistic model. Of, I mean, I can understand that if you're going into a forest and you're trashing everything, mm -hmm. that's not harmonious. But what counts is <coughs> preserving harmony, or what counts as unity, functioning? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I can say a little bit more. And I um, I mean, it, it is a, a, a tricky, slippery um, concept. But I think um, some things that are fairly intuitive at both the organismal level and the ecosystem level um, seem to naturally fit within harmony, integrity, unity. So some of the concerns of uh, ecosystem ecology with nutrient cycling and biomass stability, um, uh, energy that's uh, captured by photosynthesis, um, these, these seem to be measures, I mean, and the term is ecosystem function. So I think scientists have been studying a, a, a certain number of um, processes and, and properties over the last several decades under the heading of ecosystem function, and I think these are plausible aspects of integrity, harmony, unity. And then uh, at the organismal level, um, you know, we, we have a, a variety of cell types within our bodies, about 210 different cell types, uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, for, for the human <laughs> body. Um, and most of the time, they are uh, interacting pretty harmoniously. They're helping us to do what we're doing. Um, but sometimes one of those cell types might start multiplying wildly and become cancerous, and that's a clear case of disharmony, I think. So it's not that I have any uh, great definition, but, but I guess I would just offer what seem to be plausible examples of harmony or, or disharmony. Um, and also to say that I, I think you need something beyond just variety, because there, there do seem to be pretty clear counterexamples to the idea of you, know, you increase variety, and you automatically increase value, or maybe not. If you, if you introduce something into a system that, like an invasive species into an ecosystem, maybe you've boosted the species diversity, but it's kind of wrecking the, the nutrient cycling or, or something like that. I think you need um, something beyond uh, variety alone. Um, and one of my students this last semester argued that this actually makes uh, richness theory problematic because it, it talk, you know, there's supposedly one concept of richness, but it's really two different concepts and how do you balance one against the other. Um, and I agree that that's challenging, but I think sentientism has the same problem because how do you weigh a certain amount of pain against a certain amount of pleasure? It seems to be that uh, hedonism and probably other kinds of uh, sentientist axiology also have the, the issue of balancing more than one quantity against each other, so that's a bit of a digression. So we have uh, five minutes left and five people left on the list, so I think uh, what I'll do is you know, I'm going to ask the remaining people to very quickly okay. phrase their comments uh, in 60 seconds. Great. For Greg to think about.
Um, okay, so Tatiana is first on. Yeah, I like your paper, Professor. Um, our first point has already been raised, like the relationship between brain size and welfare. I think we were a bit too simplistic there. Okay, um, and I think even if we read that story about sentience and uh, that um, it's overall better that it happened as it did, that if there were more animals and fewer people, still we can be very unhappy as sentientists about the development because there were better alternatives. There could have been just as many people mm -hmm. uh, without making a mess out of right. natural environments. So. Virginie? I pass. You pass? Okay. Uh, Josh? Thanks. So it seems to me that richness theory or organic unity theory or various different names for it seem to lead to the conclusion that there are some humans who are more organically unified or more rich than others. So are you willing to just in human equality? Um, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Sure. So it's a fear. Uh, okay, and I have Richard, but Richard's gone, right? Yeah, okay, so maybe then actually you can respond to that. There was one Was there? Oh, sorry, Jeff, I didn't see you. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, just very quickly, uh, this is a clarificatory question. I was struck by um, you're offering different kinds of considerations in favor of ecocentrism. Mm -hmm. Some of them seem to be considerations in favor of accepting it uh, as a criterion of rightness, and others seem to be considerations in favor of accepting it as a uh, sort of at the decision procedure level or, or maybe at the sort of uh, advocacy level. So for example, the fact that it consonates uh, with public opinion mm -hmm. seems to be a reason to promote it but not necessarily a reason to actually accept it and regard it as the correct theory. So I was just wondering if you really did mean to be suggesting that we should be accepting it in different ways and for different purposes, or you somehow thought that this all contributed to an overall reason why we should accept it as the correct theory. Um, so should I start responding? Well, we have two minutes left, so I think you can pick whatever you'd like to respond to in okay. two minutes. <laughs> Maybe I'll just start with that. I mean, yeah, I don't think any of these is decisive individually. Um, it seems to me that if, you know, this kind of public opinion criterion uh, might lead you to at least be interested enough in the theory to really take it seriously and, um, you know, give it more attention than you might, than you might otherwise. So, you know, just for example, uh, maybe this, these kind of polls would lead us to take ecocentrism more seriously than if we assume that um, actually most Americans are anthropocentrists, and so the most important thing is to convince them to adopt ecocentrism. Um, this suggests that, um, anyway, I, I, yeah, I don't think any of them are, are decisive <coughs> in and of themselves. Um, and I think the second one maybe is a bit more, uh, uh, I don't know, about what, what the true theory is. So the inference of the best explanation is a pretty standard method in both ethics and science. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, um, that's what Miller and, and Kelly uh, <coughs> as well as Ben Bradley, to, to a certain extent, we try to do is just, you know, let's look at a, a few different theories and see which ones best capture our deepest, deeply held convictions, that, that kind of thing. Um, so human inequality, uh, you're right that, that, that richness theory um, implies that, that, uh, that there is inequality within humans, but I, but I think it's maybe no more or less uh, threatening than just the idea that maybe some humans are better off than others, and 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 being well off, whatever that entails, um, you know, pleasure, satisfaction, uh, knowledge, achievement, etc. There are some people who have achieved that more than others, um, and there are, there are some ways in which you know, like I can to improve, like, like if there's any possibility for any of us individually improving our lives, or in one person's life going better than another, it's, I don't think it's any more or less uh, 
threatening the net level of, um, of inequality. And, and I guess the second thing to say is um, these, these kinds of inequalities, again, are tempered for uh, ecocentrists, but not for sentientists, by higher level properties. Like, how different are you from other people, and how well you know, does, does the society as a whole uh, um, function, etc. Whereas, I, it, it seems to me, anyway, that um, sentientism, in, in many ways, if there are you know, genuine hierarchies, are kind of stuck with that. And it's not tempered by um, <clears throat> complementarity, et cetera. And for that reason, I think richness theory would actually uh, endorse levels of, let's say, material inequality among humans that are much smaller than the ones that exist in the world. I mean, we have stupendous inequalities that are probably not justifiable by any moral theory. And I think richness theory would concur that we need to massively narrow the kind of political and economic inequalities that that exist within the <coughs> human species. I guess I'm out of time, um, but good points, uh, Tatiana. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks.